And this morning we seek your presence, not the presence of anyone else. We seek your face in this place, not anybody else. We go after the blesser, not even the blessing. Lord, there is somebody in this room who needs a touch from you this morning. There is somebody in this room who needs a mighty move of God in their lives this morning. There's somebody in this room that needs to know that you love them and that you care about them. There's somebody in this room who's on the verge of giving up. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that they would have an encounter with you in this moment. Yeah. 
So starting next week, if you have any canned goods that you want to donate, we'll have a box back there for you. So please bring them. Amen. I promise I won't eat them. <laughs> We're going to give them to somebody who needs them. Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you would open them up with me, please, to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. If you watch the last three times that God has allowed me to preach, all of these, these messages and all of these words, they kind of connect. The title of today's message is God Saw and Heard Everything. God saw and heard everything. Genesis chapter 4, verse 6. I'm reading out of the NIV. I know some people feel like you can only read from this Bible and nothing else. So I'm reading from the NIV so people can understand it. Amen. I'll be reading from verse 6 through verse 10. So if you're taking notes. God saw and heard everything. And it says this. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin cr is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out into the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, 
Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Listen. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, I want to thank you for this opportunity, this privilege. I don't take it lightly. I pray that you would use me as your vessel and as your instrument to preach your word, Father. I pray that you would prepare and soften every heart, that you would quicken every heart to be ready to receive your word, that nobody would be in a place where they are no longer fillable, but that each and every one of us would be humble and teachable, teachable enough to receive whatever it is that you have in store for us. I pray that you would remove and bind and rebuke every devil, every demon that would try to hinder and that would try to distract. And I pray that you would bring healing through this word, that you would bring restoration and that you would bring redemption through this precious and powerful word. Lord, let it be profound and let it be practical. Let it be simple so that even a six year old could understand it. I pray that in Jesus name and to you be the honor, the glory and the power forever and ever in Jesus name. Amen and amen. Thank you. Please be seated in the presence of the Lord. So God continues throughout his entire word from the beginning to the end to reveal his plan for mankind. And he does it all throughout scripture. The one thing about God that you can always count on is that he's consistent. He's constant. And the Bible says he changeth not. He does not change. He is unchanging. He's immovable. Whatever he started in Genesis, he will continue with that same line of thought all the way through the book of Revelation. Think about what I'm saying. In Genesis, you start out with after the fall of man, they're, they're after they fell, right? The Bible says that God began to walk in the cool of the garden. And as he walked in the cool of the garden, he looked for the two people who had eaten of the forbidden fruit. Everybody knows the story of Adam and Eve, right? Is, does anybody not know? So I could have like a remedial class real quick. All right, good. So Adam and Eve, right? So... So they fall into sin, they eat the fruit, and then they become, their eyes, the Bible says that their eyes are open and that they, they notice that they're naked. And they become ashamed and they go and they hide and they cover themselves with fig leaves. Anybody remember the old Fruit of Loons commercial? That's how it was, right? And so there they are, they're hiding themselves and they're hiding their nakedness of their sin. If I could use terms like that for this preaching. And the Bible says that God walked through the cool of the day in the garden. And he says, Adam, where are you? God knew where Adam was. It was a rhetorical question. God will never ask you a question that he doesn't already know the answer to. Let me let you know that today. And he asked, where are you? And the Bible says that Adam says, we're hiding because we're naked. And God tells him, who told you you were naked? And then he says, what have you done? Did you eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil? And Adam and being a man, right? He blames God and his wife. He's like, look, it was the woman you gave me. <laughs> so it's between you and her. I'm out of it. Right? That's what he does. And the Bible says that at that point, he pronounces judgment because of their disobedience. And then he casts them out of the garden of Eden. He pronounces judgment on the man. He pro pronounces judgment on the woman. He pronounces judgment on Adam. And then... The Bible says that he takes together, some versions of the Bible say lambskins, others say animal skins. So if you, don't, if you don't catch it, if you're not paying attention when you read, that means that an animal had to die in order for, for their, the nakedness of their sin to be covered. You see, God has been pointing to Jesus since the beginning of time. God has been pointing to Jesus since Genesis. And all there was between Adam and Eve and that lambskin was the blood of the lamb. You see, and that thought process and that line of thought, it continues from Genesis. That theme, it goes all the way through the book of Revelation and the rest of the Bible. As a matter of fact, we use words like you are saved by the blood of the lamb of God. Amen. Anybody ever heard that term? How about in the book of Revelation where it says that we overcome by the, love, by, by, the, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. That's how you overcome, is by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. That's why it's important for you to know your Bible and not just take the preacher's word for it, but for you to know what the word of God says so that way you know what God wants to do through you in this life, what God wants to do through you in this world and how he wants to divinely impact this generation because you were picked for such a time as this. You were born for such a time as this. 
Amen? Amen. All right, all right. Don't fall asleep on me because I'll get Hannah to go wake you up. Amen? Amen? Whenever you read the Word of God, I want to encourage you and challenge you not just to read it for information. Not just to read it, read it for education or to get prepared for a Bible study or whatever the case is or to show your neighbor that you're smarter than them. Don't do it for that. Ask God for revelation. And God is faithful to show it to you. God will show you what he has in store for you in his word. There is no question that God doesn't already have the answer to. There is no question that God doesn't already have the answer to in his word. And you would just look it up. So whenever you hear all the fake news, jump in the word of God and see the real news. Amen. Amen. Before you before you get on Facebook, put your face in this book right here. Amen. Everybody with me. All right. Amen. We don't serve a God who waits for something to happen and says, oh, my God, what are we going to do? Or, oh, me, what are we going to do? Man does that. God does not do that. Amen? God already knows the answer. He's not surprised by anything. God is not reactive. He's proactive. He's sovereign. And the Bible says that he's in control. If God were reactive, then he would not be in control. He would not be in charge. But God is in control. Therefore, he has the answer to every question you'll ever ask way before you ever even thought about it. And way before you'll ever ask it. God already has the answer waiting for you. He has determined the end from the beginning. He is God and he is sovereign and he's the ruler of the universe. And the Bible says that he has all power in his hands and he's had, he has it all for you in the name of Jesus. Yeah. There are so many people who are just way too busy trying to play church. Bishop T.D. Jakes has a term for it. He calls it religiosity. I like that name. I don't even know if it's a real word, but I actually like that word. It's when people play church. They know when to stand. They know when to sit. They know when to raise their hands. They know when to shout hallelujah. They know when to give a word from the Lord. Come on. I mean, if you read your Bible, you'll see that God gave people a word. A prophet, even a prophet, every once in a while, it wasn't every day, it wasn't every week, it wasn't every Sunday, it wasn't every Wednesday, it wasn't every gathering. God gave a specific word for a specific people. See, after a while, let me just be real with you, after a while it becomes a, hey everybody look at me, I'm the church prophet. Hey everybody look at me, I have a word from the Lord. Hey everybody look at me, I speak in a tongue. And that's wrong. I don't even preach every Sunday. You want to know why? To stay humble. That's why. Because I need to receive the word too. You see, I'm not above reproach, and I'm not above correction, and I'm not above being preached to. And people who tell you, oh, I only answer to God, there's something wrong. That's why they don't want to tell you what's wrong. Amen? Amen. It's quiet in here. Did I strike a nerve? Don't worry. Sit, stay seated. I'm coming to you this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen? They know when to jump. They know when to shout. They know when to dance. They know when to greet. It's religiosity. It's plain church. And far too many people are too focused on playing church instead of knowing God. Playing church, all it's going to do is help you fit in with people and get a certain position. And this is my ministry. And it's all about my ministry. And you know what? My spouse, she can do this and she can do that. And my husband, he can do this and he can do that. Where is our place in the church so that everybody can follow me? You see, you're wrong. you got to tell them you follow Jesus. You follow him. Even Paul the Apostle said, be an imitator of me because I imitate Christ. Amen. Amen. This is church right here. This is real stuff. This is how this is how God speaks to me. It's conviction. He's like, boy, you better listen to this right here. You better you better highlight this, put a circle around it, underline it, do what you got to do because I'm speaking to you right here. Amen? Amen. Don't just look at your neighbor and be like, hey, Pastor Johnny, that's for you right there. All that. <laughs> this is for all of us. Every, each and every one of us. We need to stop playing church. You know, I don't believe that anybody in here came to play church this morning. Or anybody watching by social media, I don't think that you're here to play church. You're here to know God a little more. Amen. And knowing God, it brings life into your life. Amen? Knowing God, it brings healing and restoration and freedom and redemption. Knowing God, it gives you hope. I feel bad for the people who don't believe in God because who do they run to when they're in trouble? Who do they go to whenever that there, there is a crisis in their life? They go to nobody. They say things like, oh, you'll be in my thoughts. I don't want you to be thinking about me. Pray for me because that's what shakes the mountains according to Scripture. All you need is the mustard seed of faith and go to God and pray on my behalf. And the Bible says that you can say to that mountain, move and it will move and crumble itself into the sea. Don't think about me. Pray for me in the name of Jesus. Knowing God will help you in times of trouble. 
Knowing God will bring peace into your heart. But he has to be the alpha and the omega. He has to be the first and the last. He has to be your beginning and your end and everything in between. He's not a white God. He is God. He's not a black God. He is God. He's not a Democrat God. He's not a Republican God. He is God. He is God almighty all by himself. He always has been and he always will be. That's who he is. In case you were wondering. I'm sick and tired of watching the news and hearing what, what man has to say. I want to hear what God has to say. So here in this text, let's get back to this. I got off the subject. I'm sorry. <sighs> Satan had tricked this woman into doing the one thing that God had told them not to do. Not only the woman, but she also tricked the man. As a matter of fact, if you read your Bible and you pay attention, the man gets the blame for it. As a matter of fact... God doesn't pronounce judgment until after the man partakes of the fruit. When Adam took of the fruit, it started a chain of events that would echo all throughout history, beginning with the first two kids, Cain and Abel. And it echoed in their life. You see, when you read the Bible, you've got to pay attention to what's being said. Because the Bible says that Cain, or I'm sorry, Abel, he kept the flocks. In other words, he was a shepherd. He handled the flocks. And that Cain, he worked the ground or he worked the soil, depending on which version of the Bible you read. And basically what it's saying is that Cain, he had to work. Excuse me. He had to now work after the fall of man with what his daddy had messed up. Because if you remember correctly, on the day of sacrifice, on the day of offering, Cain came up and he offered what he got from the ground. Please pay attention to that. Because if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, God had passed judgment on the ground when he came to man. Anybody remember what the judgments were when it came to man, right? God, they fell into sin. God was like, hey, who ate the fruit? He, they tell him. And then he says, you know what, serpent? For this, you will crawl on your belly for the rest of your days. Right? And then he turns to the, to the man and he says, for this, you will work off of the sweat of your brow. And you're going to work the ground. And it'll produce thorns and thistles. In other words, it's cursed, is what he was saying. And then to the woman, he said, I will give you pain and childbearing. Do you remember that? See, Cain was working from something cursed. He was working from the ground that God had already pronounced judgment on. And according to scripture, Abel was a shepherd and he offered up, according to the scripture, it says he offered up the fat portions from some of the firstborn of the flock. Remember what I said at the beginning of this thing. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, God's solution and God's plan was to take the skins of an animal and to place them on Adam and Eve. And he covered up the nakedness of their sin with lamb skins. And the Bible says that God looked with favor on Abel's offering. God accepted Abel's offering because it was a part of his plan and it was a part of his solution. It pointed to Jesus. Abel understood the principle that without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission for sin is what the Bible says. Abel valued what God valued. And when you value what God values, you will always get God's favor. But when you try to make God want what you want and when you try to make God like what you like, you will always get rejected rejected because God doesn't work by your standard. He doesn't work by your clock. He doesn't do what's popular. As a matter of fact, in the book of Hebrews, the Bible says that by faith, Abel brought a better offering than Cain. By faith, he was commended as being righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he's dead by faith. Abel did what pleased God and not himself. You see, by faith this morning, it's time for you and I to do what pleases God and not ourselves. By faith, we need to plead the blood of Jesus this morning. By faith, we need to cover our spouses and our children with the precious blood of the Lamb. By faith, we need to cover our health and our bodies with the blood. We need to cover our jobs and our friends and our families with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We all need the blood of Jesus this morning to carry this thing through until the next generation. Amen. 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 I can imagine Adam and Eve, after hearing the pronouncement of judgment, putting all of their hope in Cain and Abel. See, this is, this is Sunday School 101 right here. 
But I want you to take it a little bit further. Because they had fallen into sin. Imagine, can you imagine how they felt? They probably felt like it was all their fault. I'm sure that none of them, because there are some of us in here who, who, who have said, even including me, man, I can't wait to get to heaven and meet Adam and Eve. I got something, right? Because of all the stuff I've gone through. But now looking back, being a student of God's word, people don't do things to get kicked out of the garden of Eden. Sometimes we get tricked into it. And that's the truth of it. The serpent, he had deceived Eve is what the Bible says. And so when God pronounces judgment on the serpent, he says this. I want you to pay attention to this because this is going to be the underlying statement throughout the rest of this message. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He didn't say between you and Eve. Remember that. He said between your seed and her seed. I want you to take note that the woman doesn't carry the seed. She carries the egg. The man carries the seed. And when the man and the woman come together, the, the, the seed fertilizes the egg. And then a baby is formed in the womb of the woman. So here he is talking about a virgin birth. A woman who is already carrying the seed of God. He's not talking about Eve. And then it goes on to say, and you shall, he shall bruise your head. He's talking about Jesus. And you shall bruise his heel. Now I want you to picture this with me. Being there in that moment when God is pronouncing judgment and he goes to the serpent and he says, I will put enmity between, between you and the woman and I will, put, I will put enmity between your seed and her, and her seed. And you, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. I want you to picture the thought process of Adam and Eve. They were probably like, that's the answer. If we could just have a child... If we could just have a baby, we could make all our wrongs right. Once again, this was their chance at redemption. This was their chance at deliverance. This was their chance to get back at the snake that had tricked them. This was their moment. This was their opportunity. So in Eve's eyes, Cain and Abel were her chance to make things right. But Cain got upset and he didn't stick to the plan. He got upset with his brother Abel because God accepted Abel's sacrifice and Abel's offering and rejected Cain's. It was jealousy and hatred according to scripture. And then God asked this question. I'll take you back to the beginning. He says, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, and I want to pause there because I wish that I could help, help the, the Bible writers out and say, even now. Just add in those two words. If you do what is right, he is talking in present terms. He's telling Cain, even now, if you were to do what is right, wouldn't you be accepted? He said, but if you don't, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. He gave him a warning. Its desire is to have you, but you must rule over it. God was basically telling Abe, uh, Cain. If you offer with the right intention, if you offer with the right motive, if you offer with the right heart, God would have accepted Cain's offering too. The Bible says that God is a respecter of no man. In other words, what he does for me, he'll do for you. But you got to come to him with the right attitude and the right motives and the right intentions. If you do things with the right attitude and the right motives and the right heart, God will accept it from you. If you could just do that, if you could just change your intentions and if you could just change your motive, if you could just change your attitude, you could change your destiny. My God, that should encourage everybody in here to let you know that your story is not over yet. You might have messed up and done some dumb stuff and made some dumb decisions, but God's not done with you yet. Change your attitude. Change. In Spanish, they call it morals, right? Change your mood. Change your countenance. Change your face. Stop living in defeat. Start living like a child of God. You might be down, but you're not out. You're still here. You still have a heartbeat and you still have a breath in your lungs. Jump back in. Good Lord, forgive me. Let's get back to it. Start walking this walk again. So God honored Abel's sacrifice and Abel had God's favor. Anybody here ever get a job that you weren't qualified for? Or an opportunity that you weren't supposed to get? A second chance at life? I'm not talking to you, Siri. <laughs> Anybody in here ever walk into a blessing or have a door open that didn't make any sense? You shouldn't have got it, but that's God's favor. That's what God's favor looks like. 
And Cain was jealous and he hated Abel because of God's favor. That tells me that there are going to be people who are going to hate you. And they're going to be jealous of you because of God's favor. And God asked Cain this question. What's wrong with you? I have, I have teenage children. And I never thought that I would ask them. But I ask them now. What is wrong with you? Have you lost your mind? Have you gone crazy? Because they think they know everything. You know, I never thought. I've seen other people's teenage children. And I thought, wow, man, I hope that never happens to me. I never thought that I would see that day. And I'm seeing it now. My kids think that they know more than me. That's funny, right? Like some, of, some of our old timers in here are like, oh, yeah, they do. Right? And now I'm, I'm at the point now where I'm like, well, go ahead, big boy. Right? I, I dare you. Like, I've been down that road. That road hurts really bad. Now, let me share my story with you so that way you don't have to go through it. And they're like, oh, but daddy, it's not going to happen to me. Okay. Dale. Right? Dale is a Hispanic euphemism for go for it. Right? Technical term. <laughs> go for it. And I tell them, hey, I, I'm praying for you, buddy. <laughs> right? You'll, you'll learn. You'll learn. You can learn the easy way. You can learn the hard way. So God asked Cain, what's wrong with you? God even went as far as to warn Cain before it was too late so that Cain could fix his heart still. And this morning, I came here to warn you before it's too late. So that you could still fix your heart and so that you could still fix your motives and so that you could still fix your intentions. You see, Cain he could have fixed everything by just fixing the motives and the intentions of his heart. This was his opportunity to fix everything, but he didn't. Instead, he went out into the field. He called his brother out into the field. And the Bible says that he tells him, let's go into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked and killed his brother, Abel. Cain tricked Abel like the way the snake the serpent tricked Eve. Abel was killed by his brothers. He was betrayed by his brother, just like the way Jesus was betrayed by one of them. You see how this all connects? It all points to Jesus. And I want you to take notice of something. For those of you who ask God, why did this happen to me? I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. Why did I have to go through this? I want you to take notice that although Abel had God's favor, Cain still killed Abel. God didn't stop it. Instead, God went to Cain and asked him a very specific question. God already knew the answer to the question. How do I know? Because he did the same thing to Cain's daddy in the garden. He asked Adam, Adam, where are you? He knew where he was. God is omniscient and omnipotent. He's all powerful and he's all knowing. And now he was asking Cain, where is your brother? I think that those are two very important questions to, for you to understand what God and who God is concerned about. Where are you? He's concerned about where you're at spiritually. It's not that he doesn't know. It's a rhetorical question. He already knows the answer to the question. He's asking you to check yourself. That's what he's doing. And when he says, where is your brother? He's not asking for the answer. That's why it doesn't matter what Cain said. Am I my brother's keeper? God didn't want to hear that. And then God cut to the chase with him and said, hey, your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. You see, God is concerned with how you're doing spiritually, and then he's concerned about accountability. So for those of you who feel like I only answer to God, God wouldn't have put all of us in this same room if we didn't have to answer to each other and be there for each other. As we say at this church, we are in this together, and we're only getting out of here together. So the Bible says that God asked him, where is your brother? And then the Bible goes on to say that God could literally hear Abel's blood crying out of the ground. You see, this should let you know that God sees and hears everything. God has seen and he's heard in the times that you've been cheated and mistreated. He's seen and he's heard in the times that you've been wronged in your life. The Bible says that God will bring everything that's been done in darkness into the light. You see, because God sees and he hears everything. He's seen and he's heard when you cried yourself to sleep at night. He's seen and he's heard all the unsolved crimes and he knows who did it. He's seen and he's heard the injustices of people that are in the authority and what they've done and he's taken note of it. He's seen and he's heard betrayal. I came here to tell you this morning that God has seen and
and he's heard everything. Nobody has gotten away with anything. You can try to lie, but God already knows. You can try to hire an attorney and buy your way out, but God already knows. You thought you would have, you had gotten away with it, but you didn't because God already knows. If you've ever been victimized in any kind of way, don't you think for one second that the person who did it to you got away with it? God saw and he heard everything. There is no rape. There is no abuse. There is no molestation that God does not know about. He's seen and he's heard everything and he's taken a record of it. And one day somebody's going to answer for what they've done. Amen. And the Bible says, if you continue to read in Genesis, where we started out with, that God had pronounced a, a curse on Cain, told him he was cursed to wander the land. Anybody who does wrong to another person doesn't repent and ask forgiveness from it. Even elsewhere in scripture, it says that you bring a curse upon yourself. The people who did you wrong, they brought a curse upon themselves and they haven't done, they haven't gotten away with it. God saw and heard everything. Don't even try to get even with them. Leave it in God's hands. The battle is no longer yours. It belongs to the Lord. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. God is going to take care of it. Don't worry about it any longer. See, many of us, we want to take matters into our own hands and we want to settle the score our own way. But you can't do what God can do. God can do a way better job than you can. So if you've ever done somebody wrong, go and make it right. Humble yourself. I heard a preacher once say that Adam, that he was trying to lay blame on who, who the fault came upon. Was it Adam's fault or was it Eve's fault? Ultimately, the Bible says that God held Adam accountable and responsible. The end of it, they both got punished and judged for it. But he said, Eve had to admit that she was wrong. And then he said, Eve had to admit that she had been fooled. He says, do you know how hard it is for a woman to admit that she's been wrong or fooled? Because <laughs> even if I'm wrong, it's your fault that I'm wrong. That's what the preacher, I'm not saying that ladies, the preacher said that, so I'll just pass it along. <laughs> so if you've done something wrong, go and make it right. You know that in 1 Corinthians, it says that if you judge yourself, you have no need of a judge. You see, many of us, we try to justify ourselves. We try to justify our actions. I would have never done this if you hadn't done that. And in reality, if you judge yourself, the Bible says that you have no need of a judge. You need to learn to apologize, even when it's not your fault. Apologize for your part in it. You see, reading all of this, I start to realize that when you start to try to relate to the script, to the characters in the Bible, I think Eve must have lost all hope because that was her chance. To make things right. Her chance was gone. Her opportunity to fix and right her wrongs was now dead. She had one son, Abel, who was dead. And the other son, Cain, who was cursed to be a wanderer throughout the earth. Her hopes and her dreams were, they were all wrong. They were her last chance at salvation. They were her last chance at restoration. They were her last chance at redemption. And things look bad in the Bible. Until you get to the book of Hebrews. Because Hebrews gives you a little bit of insight it tells you and it shows you that Abel had to die because he was a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ you see all of the things that have happened in the Old Testament and all of the sacrifices and all of the offerings they all point to what God was going to fulfill through Jesus when you read about the blood of the lamb being painted on the doorpost in the book of Exodus it's pointing to the, power, the saving power of the blood of the sacrificial lamb of God. It's pointing to Jesus. You see, the lamb, it was just a substitute for the Son of God. The Son of God, he is the sacrificial lamb. And it all started in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve fell. And God had to take the lambskins and cover the nakedness of their sin. When we sing songs like, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, holy, holy is he. Sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. And then they sing it again and they say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. 
Who are they singing about? They're not singing about a lamb. They're singing about Jesus, the Lamb of God. That's who they're singing about. That's who we sing about when we sing about it. You see, God has never lost control, not even in your situation, not even in your circumstance. He saw and he heard everything and he's still in control and he still has a plan and he still has all the power. And when God said the seed of the woman, he was not talking about Eve. He was talking about the Virgin Mary. How do I know? Because I told you earlier, the woman carries the egg, the man carries the seed. So when he was talking about a woman who had never been with a man and he said, there will be enmity between your seed and her seed. He was talking about Jesus. I want you to know that that should tell you that everything that you've gone through in your life, everything that you've been through, all the hardships and all the heartaches and all the heartbreaks and all the good times, it was it all happened the way that it was supposed to happen. You lost what you were supposed to lose. And God is still God and he's still in charge and he's still in control and he still has your back. The devil hasn't won in your life. God still has a plan. God is still going to get the victory in your life. The Bible says greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You see, there's still hope and there's still a chance. You need to rise up and be the Christian that God created you to be. The Bible says that the battle is the Lord's. Even if it's hurting you now, it belongs to God. It's no longer yours. I want to share a story with you, if that's okay. Rose was talking to somebody about this the other day. We were talking about uh, my oldest son, Georgie. Her, her labor, and I've shared this with you before in other preachings, her labor was like bad. It was so bad. It was the year of the flood in 2001. And all the electricity went out in the hospital. It was so bad that they, they had to go old school and they had to tape, put a tape around her. 2002. I'm sorry, baby. Thank you for the correction again. 2002. See, she's good, man. That's why I got her here. So, in 2002, thank you, baby. Um, there was a big flood. Woodlawn Lake had overflowed. It could be the front page of the paper. Back then, we used to get the paper still, right? And so... So Ger Georgie's born, and there's a bunch of complications. It's bad. I mean, Georgie was the biggest kid in the NICU. I've told you all this before. Georgie almost like, like ripped my wife in half coming out, right? Like straight up, he was the biggest kid. And there was a lot of complications. And I remember at one point thinking, man, she is never going to have another baby with me ever, ever, ever. <laughs> because of what I saw in the labor and delivery room, right? She was sharing this baby. Since you're here, how long did it take you to get back to normal? Six months. Six months. Like that's how long it took her to be able to get out of bed without assistance. She couldn't even walk. How long were you in labor for? 21 hours, pushed for four hours. It's a long time, right? She was in labor for 21 hours, she pushed for four hours. And I thought she'll never give me another baby because he's a Georgie, it's his fault, right? <laughs> Well, we get pregnant again in 2004. Well, we have Rebecca in 2004. And we had our issues with her pregnancy as well. But, you know, there towards the end, the, the ladies started getting happy. It's almost like they went through all this pain. They went through all this suffering through the, through the labor and delivery. And then they forget about it once they get to hold the baby. And once they get to, to love on the baby, all of a sudden it all was worth it. Am I right, mamas? Is that how it is? And so Rose says that when we started having another baby, she was like, as the youngsters say, she was down for the cause, right? So, so there she was until the day of delivery. And then she started to remember, oh man, I know what's next, right? And I found it interesting because she still did it even two more times after Rebecca. Because there's something about that pain that you go through when you get to hold that baby in your hands that you say, you know what, it was worth it. It was worth this thing right here. And I share that with you because if you read the story of Adam and Eve and you continue to read in Genesis, what you will find is that after Cain killed Abel and Cain was cursed to walk the land, the Bible says that Adam and Eve knew each other once again in some versions. For those of you who don't know what new means, it means that they were intimate, that they had sexual relations, they had sex. I can say sex from the pulpit, right? So, 
So they had sex and they had another child. They conceived another child. And that child's name was Seth. They named him Seth. Seth means appointment. You see, that tells me that they realized God is going to do it again. And I came here to tell somebody this morning, just like the way God did with Rose and I, with another child, and then three more after, that God is going to do it again. He's going to give you your visions and your dreams back. But he's going to do it at his appointed time. You know that Jesus came from the line of Seth? He came through the line of Seth. So we could therefore say that Jesus came through the line of appointment. And Jesus, if you say it in Hebrew, it's what, Dr. Yeshua. Yeshua. What does Yeshua mean? Does anybody know? Jesus. It means, yes, thank you. It does mean Jesus. What is the literal translation? That's right. Or salvation. Right? Yahovah, God saves, is what Yeshua means. Literal translation. Jesus, Yeshua. Salvation didn't come the way that Adam and Eve thought that it was going to come. Salvation came through an appointed time, and his name is Jesus. Your salvation may not come the way that you thought it was going to come. Your salvation will only come, according to Scripture, through the blood of Jesus Christ at his appointed time. And I believe that that time is now in this moment. I believe that God has a plan and he's in control of your life. And everything that you went through and everything that you've been through, it was for a purpose. And you have to find it, that purpose, what it was for. I have many people who come to me and they'll tell me, I don't know what my purpose is for. I don't know why God created me then we need to focus on those areas. And I've preached about it before. What comes easy to you? What comes natural to you? Start there. If you want to find out God's purpose for your life, would you help me out? Brother Johnny, would you set me up? And this morning, I told you it wasn't going to take too long. I want to have an altar call. Because I want you to know that everything that you've been through and everything that you've gone through, God has seen and He's heard everything. He heard what your ex-spouse said. He heard the curses and the names that you've been called. He's heard those things. But I want you to know that you're his child. And he has a plan for you and he's in control. You went through what you were supposed to go through. Now I want you to heal from it. And I want you to move forward from it. And I want you to help others. Because you didn't go through it for nothing. Everything that me and my wife that we've gone through in our matrimony, it wasn't for nothing. It was because God was going to use us at this day, in this hour, to help others who were going through that and worse. And this morning, I want you to know that you have a Savior, you have a Redeemer who allows you to go through things to raise you up, to strengthen you, to equip you to be who He called you to be, who He created you to be. And from what I'm reading in Scripture, He didn't create you or call you just to sit in a pew. He called you to help others. We're in this together. He's seen and he's heard everything and it was not for it was if I can use double negatives it was not for nothing you went through it for something and now we need to find out why you went through it and we need to move forward from it I came here to prove every devil in hell a liar this morning in the name of Jesus by the blood of Jesus and to tell you child of God be set free everything that you went through the loss the pain the hurt everything you went through the heartbreak the heartache it was for a reason don't let it be for nothing don't let it be for in vain that family member didn't die for nothing rise up and be the child of God that he called you to be that divorce wasn't for nothing that thing that almost killed you it wasn't for nothing God saw and he heard everything. And today, he wants to heal you and set you free. Hallelujah! Would you please stand to your feet? Oh, Holy Spirit, you are here. Holy Spirit, you are here. I want to invite you to this altar and give God what he saw and what he heard. We're going to let the Holy Spirit take control of this service for the next 15 minutes. This altar is now open.
experiencing loss and going through difficulties in our in our life. But I just want to share this with you. This is something that that the I, I uh, shared a little bit about it on Wednesday night in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah had a great vision in, in chapter six of Isaiah, and it says that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord lifted up, and he saw a revelation of God. And it totally it started his ministry, really, and it didn't happen until it was loss experienced. Some of you have had great loss, and you're frustrated, and you're hurt, and you're and you're angry. But I'm here to tell you that God's about to show you who He is in a deeper way. Be open to that. Be open. Don't, don't, don't push it away. But embrace and say, God, I want to know you more. And it didn't happen in Isaiah's life till great loss. Uzziah was a great king. Uzziah did many, many great exploits. And everyone looked up to this man. And he had a special relationship with Isaiah. But the day, in the year that he died, that's when the Lord showed up in Isaiah's life like never before. God's about to show up in your life like never before. A great anointing is going to come on you. A great calling is going to come on you. Some of you have ministries going to be birthed in you because of loss. Isn't God awesome? Amen. The punch, the death blow that the devil thought, I got him. I got him. I got him. It's what's going to propel you forward into into a great ministry for the Lord. See how great God is? Amen. The devil's, oh my gosh. Oh, I can't even. He thinks he's smart. He thinks he has it all. But God is greater. And his love is greater. You thought you knew God's love? Just hold on. You thought you knew how good? Just hold on. God's about to blow your mind. Amen. Amen. God's about to use you and propel you forward in the name of Jesus was meant to destroy you and hurt you just like Joseph said God's about to turn it around he meant it for good amen. he meant it for good amen let's give the Lord a hand amen praise God every head bowed and every eye closed please nobody looking around this is a private moment just between you and God So I've been I've been criticized and ridiculed for doing this at the end of every service. Let me, let me make it clear. Just saying a prayer, it doesn't save you. Okay? Transferring your trust is what's going to save you. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that He died for your sins and on the third day God raised Him from the dead, the Bible says you shall be saved. It says that they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I, I say this every Sunday, and I'm going to tell you why I say it every Sunday. It's because I was a little church kid growing up in the pews, and the church I attended, they always had a prayer of salvation every Sunday, every Sunday, every Sunday. And I must have said that prayer of salvation about a thousand times, but there was this one time where it clicked for me, and it made sense, and then everything came into focus. And I feel... Like this, if God was so merciful and so gracious to a sinner like me to allow that to take place a thousand times, why would I miss on an opportunity to allow God to use this church to do it for someone else? That's the straight God's honest truth. And that's why I do it every Sunday. So for the naysayers who say, why do you have to do it every Sunday? That's why I do it every Sunday. Because souls are at stake and because eternity is at stake. And it's not about me. It's about what the Word of God says and it's about God's people. Amen. 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 So with all of that being said, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and God is tugging at your heart right now in this moment, example of a prayer, you can say it however you want. The key is, is that you have to confess it with your mouth. Not in your thoughts, not in your heart. Confess it with your mouth. Don't let the devil shut you up another second. And believe it in your heart. The Bible promises that you shall be saved. It doesn't say you might be saved, you may be saved, you could be saved. There is a slight possibility. It says you shall. That means you have to be saved. That's how you know whether or not you're saved. So, all of this being said, 
If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and this morning you say, I want to surrender my life to God right now. If that's you with nobody looking around, I'm going to ask you to raise your right hand. Maybe you've been walking with the Lord and you've fallen and you failed and you feel like a failure. And this morning, I want to take that weapon away from the devil. And I want to encourage you to jump back in. And if that's you, I'm going to ask you to raise your right hand. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There are hands going up in this room. I thank you for your boldness and I thank you for your transparency and I thank you for your kindness. God, even more importantly than me seeing your hand go up, God Almighty saw your hand. And so now in this moment and in this opportunity and this privilege and this honor, I'd like to lead you in a prayer. You can say it however you want, but it's between you and God this morning. All I am is a facilitator. That's it. He gets it all. Would you say, Heavenly Father, I come before you right now and I confess that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you are the Savior, the precious Lamb of God. And I confess you as Lord, Savior, and Master of my life. Please forgive me. Please wash me. Cleanse me. Make me into who you created me to be. Make me into that man or woman of God that you created me to be. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you for your gift of salvation, Yeshua. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. I promise and I commit from this day forward that I will follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's pray to be dismissed. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gathering that we had here this morning. I thank you for the people who were watching on any type of, of social media platform. I pray in the name of Jesus that this word would get out there and that it would be life-changing, Father God. That it would save souls from the very pits of hell. That it would be you who saves them and that you be, it would be you who gets all the honor and all the glory. Father, I pray that church would begin as we walk out those doors and that we would share your love, your mercy, your grace, and your forgiveness with everyone that we come in contact with. Now, may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. May he turn his countenance towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name. Journey to the cross. I love you. God bless you. Have an awesome week. <laughs> yeah. Open, all right. Stop by and get a coffee before you go. Thank you for hey. coming. Oh yeah, no problem. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's message, please subscribe below.